Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Astoria Bookshop launch of Sophie and the Bone Song. We're here with Adrienne Tooley and Allison Saft, um, and we're so excited to talk about this book today. I'm Laura. I'm the event coordinator for the Astoria Bookshop, and if you don't know who we are, um, we are a general interest bookstore in Astoria, Queens, and you should check out our website at astoriabookshop.com or click that beautiful green button below to uh, get a signed copy. Um, other than that, let's see. Um, you can ask questions throughout the whole the whole discussion. I will pop back in around 7.50 to answer them, but um, you can ask questions where it says ask a question or vote on other people's questions if there's something you really want answered. And uh, please be respectful. Don't say anything you wouldn't want your mom or boss to see. And uh, that's, <laughs> that's usually a good rule of thumb, um, but we usually don't have problems with that. Everyone who comes to events is wonderful. And uh, yeah. Other than that, let's get on with introducing our guests. So first we have the guest of honor, Adrienne Tooley. Um, Adrienne grew up in Southern California, majored in musical theater in Pittsburgh, and now lives in Brooklyn with her wife, eight guitars, a puppy, and a banjo. In addition to writing novels, she is a singer slash songwriter who has currently released three indie folk EPs. She is the author of the whimsical sapphic fantasy, Sweet and Bitter Magic, and Sophie and the Bone Song. Find her at Adrian Tooley. Um, Allison Saft is the author of eerie and critically acclaimed romantic fantasies, Down Comes the Night and A Far Wilder Magic. After receiving her MA in English Literature from Tulane in University, she has moved from the Gulf Coast to the West Coast, where she spends her time hiking the redwoods and practicing aerial silks. Both ridiculously cool people. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I, with that, I will leave you guys to it. I'll be back at 7.50. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Laura. Yay, Adrienne. Yes. It is so, so exciting to be here with you tonight to talk about Sophie and the Bone Song, which I was looking at my email I read in July of 2021. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, and again, over the weekend, which was a joy being back in the world with Sophie and Laura. Um, but yes, how are you feeling, first of all? Um, good question mark. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I feel like you probably have something similar having like launched a far wilder magic this year. It's like very different than your debut, but also at the same time, like everything still kind of feels like it's your debut. Like there's like less pressure, but also like more pressure, but in like different ways this time. And like, now you have like a readership and like, oh no, are they going to like this one as much as they like the last one? If they hated the last one, will they hate this one too? Like you never know. And it's just like, it's just like one of those things. So now this book is officially everyone else's problem and uh, not mine anymore. So. Um, that's the best feeling though. But uh, I mean, I don't know how anyone can not like this book. Um, it is absolutely wonderful, which I'm going to inundate you with questions about. But first, I feel like we should uh, start with the basics. Um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, Sophie and the Bone Song? What is it about? And I'm also curious to hear a little bit about um, the spark of this idea or the process of writing it, whatever you would like to tell us about. Yeah, um, you would think I'd be better at my elevator pitch by now, like at this point in the process. Um, so I'm going to try, but I might fail. Um, so Sophie and the Bone Song is uh, a story that centers around Sophie, who has been training her entire life to um, audition for and, as she assumes, inherit the title of music, um, which is in their kingdom only certain people can play instruments and compose songs in public. Um, so she spent her entire life training to inherit her father's title and his bone loot. Um, but of course, on the day of auditions, things do not go as planned, and she loses the title to Lara, who is a girl who has never played the loot before. Um, and Sophie, who is a self-righteous perfectionist, doesn't believe that that is right or fair or true, so she calms her way onto Lara's victory tour writes her songs and tries to uncover Lara's use of illegal magic, because if something's coming too easily, it must be magic, not hard work. Um, but on the road with Lara, she uncovers many secrets about herself and her family and her music 
and she also falls in love. Of course, of course. Of course, of course. Can, can it really be an Adrian Truly book if two girls do not spend a lot of time on the road together and fall in love? Like, that's <laughs> kind of the brand and at this point. We possibly want, it is everything. I'm also cracking up what you're describing as Sophia, self-righteous perfectionist, because I'm like, I relate so intensely to Sophia. Oh, <laughs> same. There, there oh, are some oh, things. There are some things in there that, like, I feel like my therapist might read this book and then be like, "Okay, so we have a lot to talk about now." <laughs> <laughs> Let's unpack this. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And um, and how did how did you come up with this idea? I, it's so funny. I don't remember the exact moment that I came up with it, but I do remember the feeling of like writing the, what the first chapter that doesn't look like anything in the published novel. But I remember that Sophie kind of came fully formed. I'm like, was, I'm, I'm a character driven person. If you've read any of my novels, you know that I'm all character, few plot vibes. Um, and so I like I started with her. I'm interested in like the lives of people that we maybe don't always see centered and like in every hero quest there's like a bard playing in the corner of the tavern and you get like the song and then they're forgotten and it's sort of like what would that person's life look like and like what what would that be um and also you know music is a huge part of my own life um it's I you know I I used to write my own music I don't really have time to write music anymore but it's how I met my wife she works in music like as her profession. So we're surrounded by it all the time. And I was really excited about the idea of exploring music, but from a fantasy lens, because I felt like there was such a good opportunity and not a lot of books that I've read so far have really delved into that world. And I thought it would be a really fun opportunity to try something like kind of new. I love that. And I feel like what you've talked about there shines through in the book so much, like that sense of community with music and, the coziness of like the fantasy tavern yes across a whole book it's so wonderful yeah. um that actually so i'm curious you you said the you mentioned the first chapter that does not appear yes. in the books so can you tell me a little bit more about like the process of of uh the making sophie what it is like how yeah is the you're getting it like totally um sophie has gone through many iterations in like kind of a small period of time um I, I had the idea in, I think it was like 2019, and I think I was still doing edits for Sweet and Bitter Magic or something like that. And But I had this chapter that I loved and like I got to play with like the lyrical swishing of skirts and sounds and music in the winter. And I was like, okay, there's something here. I want to hold on to this. And um, it was ended up being my option book. So we sent it to my editor with like three chapters and like a synopsis. And then I wrote the first draft and I think a few people who are here did me the, the gracious duty of reading that. Um, and then my editor was like, great, I have some questions. And she had so many good questions that in my first round of revisions, I completely white paged the book. Um, and oh, I rewrote the whole thing in like a month. And oh. so, yeah. So when I say that it looks nothing like the original is because I, I truly just like changed like everything like halfway through revisions. Wow, so, that's awesome. Yeah, so there's some people who are like, oh, I can't wait to see like what you've changed since I read it. And I was like, oh, the entire book. Yeah. I changed the entire book. It's all different. Like the character names are the same and that's about it. Um, wow, was, yeah, you know, I, I can relate to that though. The yes. It's always the post first draft, like, okay, well, I wrote it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only way to write it right is to undo everything I just did. Um, yeah, glamorous. It's so glamorous to write books. Uh, it sure <laughs> is. Uh, um, I did want to circle back to something you, well, I mean, as we've been talking about, that music is a huge part of your life. And obviously, music is a huge part of this book and Sophie's life. Um, I'm, I'm, and also I see in the uh, comment section that Courtney says that Adrian has such a beautiful voice. Absolutely true. I listened to some of your music over the weekend um it's so good so everyone listen to adrian's music and buy her book um but in the meantime uh could you tell me a little bit about how your experience as a musician kind of informed uh, not only sophie as a character but kind of the the world um that the book is set in uh because 
as you mentioned in your short pitch, it's so interesting to me that music is kind of this like restricted uh, thing, uh, restricted art to only the few. And I, I just love this idea and I'd love to hear more about how you develop this. Yeah, um, so like I live in New York for anyone that doesn't know that. Um, and like I said, my wife like works in music. So we spent a ton of time pre pandemic going to like live shows and like there are these like great venues in the city where you like can walk in at five and a different artist plays every like 45 minutes until like 3 a.m. And um, you just see how music is different to every single person that's creating it. It's sort of like that idea that like even if like two authors have the same prompt, they're going to write like two completely different stories. Um, and I just I love the idea that like music is so personal, but also you have the ability to like make it super competitive like you hear about all of these like kids who are like i'm gonna be in like an orchestra pianist and i train i do violin lessons for you know 15 hours a week on top of ap classes and this and like it can almost be this competition as well so um i'm not like a sports person at all so i was like how can i like use this thing that i know to also like build this like competitive edge and it, it was just so interesting to me this idea of like something that could be so different for everyone having like a like a, a almost a competition of like you can qualify for this and if you don't make it you just can't do it anymore sort of like I feel like the Olympics were on and I was watching like gymnastics and it's like those girls turn like 21 and they're like okay I guess my career's over but what do I do I've like de like dedicated all of this time to this very specific thing um, and I loved that idea of torturing my character having given her this thing that she works for so hard and just like taking that away and then it's like well what what do you have left and who are you without that thing that is your identity which i feel like is kind of a universal teenage experience even if you're not a musician yeah i was gonna say like i, I can definitely relate i i was in marching band in high school um, oh my gosh what did you play uh, I played during, well, during marching band season, I played the saxophone, and then during concert season, I played the bass clarinet. Um, yes, but it's about you. I, yes, <laughs> we'll talk. Um, but there was a, a girl in my band who was a brilliant flautist, and I just remember, like, the intense preparation that went into, like, auditions for, I think she applied to Juilliard. So, yeah, I mean, music, yeah. music is intense. Music it's is, intense. like, as competitive as any sport. Um, and I felt that in this book, like so much of like what Sophie went through. I'm like, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, like the inciting incident with like Laura taking her place. I'm just like, this is unforgivable. How are we going to move past this? But yes. you do so beautifully with like, I mean, like you say, that the quintessential part of finding yourself, like of the teenage experience is like having one thing be your identity and learn that there's like, more to yourself beyond yes. like this one thing you've prepared yourself for. Exactly. So that's, that's what I love about this book. Um, I do want to ask you, in addition to the musical world building, uh, a little bit about like the magic. Um, you have quite a few different magic systems in here, which all of which are so cool. But one of my favorites um, is the papers. Um, and I'll probably ask you to just, I mean, Correct me if I'm wrong, but for anyone who hasn't read the book yet, it's essentially like you you write something or you can purchase these papers that have mm -hmm. like a spell on them essentially and, and using them allows the effect of whatever paper you purchase, like paper That's for hair, you make it hair. Exactly. Um, so I, I love this concept and I think it's super cool and with how it ties in with the themes of your book, uh, such as perfectionism and um, I mean, like I said, Sophie is a very relatable character and part of her discomfort with the papers is that they can make people seem almost eerily perfect. Like if you mm -hmm. show over, you know, uh, my perfect makeup or perfect hair. Um, so Sophie's uncomfortable with this, but strives for perfection in herself. Um, and this drive for perfectionism without getting too spoilery um, has a really disastrous consequences for her artistically and emotionally. Um, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about, um, oh my gosh, I asked you like two questions. I was gonna ask you to talk about the papers, but now I'm asking you about perfectionism. So whichever you'd like to talk about. <laughs> I, think um, they, I, I think it goes hand in hand. <laughs> yeah, so just generally magic system and uh, how it relates to like why you chose to explore the themes you did with uh, Sophie's arc in particular. 
No, this is such a such a good two prong question. Um, when I went about designing the papers were like a later edition and they were a, they were a white white page redraft edition um to this because i realized that when i was like building this book like there are a couple different magic systems um and and sophie's discomfort with magic is is kind of a, an important piece of her journey and her growth is learning how to like let go of that fear but in order for her to be uncomfortable with magic, I needed to figure out a way to build a system that would make her angry. And she's the kind of person who's like, if you're not working hard and you're not doing it yourself, then it isn't valuable and it isn't important. And so by being able to build this magic system where truly like if you have a coin, you can buy this piece of paper that says fire and it'll just be there or like, you know, buy this piece of paper and draw a beautiful picture. And she's like, well, you're not really doing that. It's the magic that's doing it. And so like, I truly created this magic system to piss her off is, is the easiest way I can say this. I was like, what would be her nightmare? And it would be having everybody make the things that they do look effortless when she feels every single ounce of the work that she puts in to the things that she loves. And so for her, it's, it's, it isn't fair. It doesn't feel fair that, that someone could exist and be so good at something. And like, she could do it too, but it would feel false to her. And therefore it's, it's false when they do it, even though it's not her action. Um, so that's kind of how I, I went about building that. And it made the exploration of art and like the fact that like music was this sort of like last protected piece of art, like more valuable for her because she can now feel this sense of moral superiority that she has dedicated her life to this, this one sacred craft where if you use magic in your music, you become red listed, red listed, which means you can never play or perform ever again, which is her literal worst nightmare. Like that's worse than death for her. Um, so I think that I built the magic system to kind of help support her perfectionism and to give her that like moral righteousness of her backbone to be like, I am best because I do it this way. And I, you know, I put my blood and my sweat and my tears into this. And so therefore this work is more valuable than, you know, someone who just paid for it, which is a very narrow minded way to look at art because like people produce art in very different ways. And like, one person's way of creating art is not another's and like that's a larger conversation about like is does art need to be valuable is art how is like how do we find the value in art and that's probably like an adult novel thesis but um i think that ultimately her perfectionism was was served by the creation of this particular magic system because that accessibility only made her like harbor more resentment and push herself even harder to be like, I can be better than easy. If that makes sense. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. No, and I, I, you achieved what you outlined here so beautifully. Like, I love what you said that like you, you made the magic system to piss Sophie off. And I feel like that's what gives yourself, your, your book so much emotional resonance is that like every piece of this world feels as though it like, impact Sophie's character arc or stems from her in some way. So it's, I don't know, just very lovely to read um, your work in general. Sorry, this is just Allison fangirls over Adrian for an hour. Um, a slight pivot, um, but I wanted to ask, since both Sweet and Bitter Magic and Sophie are um, have these lovely romances at the heart of them. So I wanted to ask broadly um, how you approach writing romances, um, because they're just so lovely. Um, so like Adrian Tooley's theory of romance writing. Um, and then also, um, if you would tell us a little bit more about um, what or how you approached also writing specifically Sophie and Laura's romance. Um, I love them uh, partially because of this intense rivals to lovers arc that they have, like they grow together so much and it's just so beautiful to see. I think you like you touch on that almost in your question. You touch on my answer. Um, but this is actually very timely because I'm in revisions for my third book right now. And one of the things that I'm pumping up is the romance. And so I'm like, I'm like, okay, I'm craft goggles on. Um, so 
one of the things that I always forget to do in my first drafts and then do later on once someone reminds me is I focus on what it is that person A hates in themselves that they see in person B and what they see in person B that they wish they had. And like from there, you have a good idea of how to craft like the underline of like any tension, but also the underline of like what makes them special. So it's like for, so for Sophie and Laura specifically, Laura makes everything look easy. And that is Sophie's worst nightmare. But at the same time, she's so joyful about the music and she has that love for the music that Sophie also shares. And so she can see that thing that she loves and she can see that thing that she hates. And like, it's then just about getting that thing that she loves to win. And so I think for me, that's like how, also I'm like, I should take notes. I have to, to look over. I'm like, I'm, am I writing this down? Um, <laughs> but so for me, that's like really what I wanted to do because I, I, this book is like, fully about Sophie. It's her face on the cover. It's her name in the, on the book. Like it is about her journey. Oh my gosh. Thank you. They're recording. Um, <laughs> it's about her journey. And so I, I wanted her to someone who like thinks that the only thing she can love is music. If she was going to break that and if she was going to fall for somebody, it needed to be somebody that she could share that first love with. And so like, I had to find this balance of like, Laura being this like sweet, excited person who like doesn't understand why Sophie is so mad at her all the time because she's just like, I just I, I love it and I'm good at it. I don't what's the problem? And so like, I haven't worked hard enough. And like that's where I started. <laughs> I love that. Oh my gosh. One, honestly, one of my, I'll ask you yours later, but one of my favorite scenes in the book is where, um, I think it might be when Lara sees Sophie play for the first time and she's like, oh my God, like, why are you making that face? Like, you're scaring me. Like, you look like you're in pain. <laughs> yeah, they're perfect grumpy sunshine romance. I love them. Um, actually, why don't I ask you now, what is your favorite moment in Sophie and the Bone Song? One of them is spoilery, so I won't say. Um, but my other one is like one of the only scenes that made it through my white page redraft. Um, and that is the scene where they're like at the very beginning of their journey on the road with Sophie and Lara. And she, Sophie realizes that she needs to explain to Lara how to like craft a song. And like Lara has no idea. And so Sophie has to like find something that Lara understands to like help her understand how to like compose a song. And so she basically explains how to write a song, like how to like sew a dress. Um, and I just, I loved writing that. And every time I read it, it just like makes me giggle. Like the idea of like having to teach somebody something that like, you know, so well that you don't even know how to explain it. And then having to like, put it into some way that they will understand. And there, there's just something about that moment. It's like the first moment where Sophie like gives a little bit. And the first moment that Laura like learns from her. And it's like, you said, like, oh, like, you know what you're doing, but also like, what are you doing? And I think it's this like perfect moment of like Sophie like opening the door a little bit and Laura being like, what are you doing in there? And and then they kind of take that and run with it. Oh, that's so true. No, that's right. Yeah, because I'm remembering like, I, I feel like that's also the moment that, I mean, like you say, Sophie kind of gives a little and she's like, oh, see, you are an artist. You you know about fashion and stuff. Exactly. Like, commonality. Oh, them. Um kind of expanding on talking about the relationships in the book um one of the most interesting ones in the book is the relationship between sophie and her dad mm -hmm. uh frederick who is not a nice man uh but he is a very complicated and compelling character um who we get to know over the course of the book um and i was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that dynamic, what it was like writing it, why you chose to write it, or what you hope readers will take away from Sophie's uh, fraught relationship with her father. Um, great question. And just to preface this, because I feel like my dad might be watching, my dad's really great. And this was <laughs> not based on a true story. So just throwing that out there ahead of time. Um, no, but I this was always this was the first relationship i knew about in the book like when when it all started i knew sophie and i knew her dad and i knew that their relationship was messy and then everything kind of came from there um 
I loved the idea of idolizing someone who's also supposed to like parent you, but they end up taking on this more of like a teacher role rather than a parent role. And so like that complicates her life twofold because he is her father, but he's actually her teacher. And the thing, the only way that they know how to communicate with each other is through music. And so like it, it they lose that father daughter thing, but because she's his child, I think he also sees her as being more mold moldable and more, more shapeable and like being able to carry on this legacy. And it's like, oh, well, I'm your dad. So I'm doing this because I love you but it's always unspoken. And she has to be like, well, I'm sure he loves me and that's why he's doing this. And and even though that's not my like personal relationship, I have had relationships in my life where people hurt you or take advantage of you and they treat you in ways like you should be grateful for any of their attention. And you spend your time calculating and being like, okay, well, this is only because of how they care about me and and they would they would never you know do this if they, if there wasn't a reason for it and i think that as a teenager you're especially susceptible to that kind of like emotional manipulation and those kind of like emotional justifications that you give yourself um and i wanted to i wanted to give an outlet to that in this story of sometimes the people that are supposed to take care of you and whether they're a parent or a friend or a whatever a mentor sometimes they don't and that's not your fault and and that was kind of the like the larger theme that i really wanted to explore and frederick was such a perfect conduit for that because like you get these flashbacks where you see that he's not a bad person per se like i mean he is but like you can see the the glimpses of humanity and you can see those moments of like why Sophie would hold on and be like, I can justify this. But like, as she learns throughout the book and as Lara is there to remind her, like, that's not enough and that shouldn't be enough. And, and I really wanted to be able to write that for teenage readers, because I think it's super important to know that like, that's never your fault. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the many reasons why I felt you wrote this book specifically for me. Like I would have loved to have this book as a teen. It would have meant a lot. Yeah. I mean that, and that is the reason why I found Tim so interesting. Like, cause like you say, it's like, you can almost understand him, mm -hmm. but it's like the effort to like, try to give your child what you didn't have often does not go very well. No. <laughs> yeah. I also love the scene after the audition where they're in the the carriage together and he just like they have this moment where he's like ah I see it is what I have sown <laughs> and now I am reaping yes I'm like yep you did this to yourself I think. um <laughs> but um what I also wanted to ask you about um the next oh let me briefly interject and say I have a couple more questions left for you but um there is a ask a, oh I see another one just appeared an ask a question feature at the bottom here um so if you have any questions for Adrian uh please type them in and we will answer them at the end um but until then uh I did want to ask you about um kind of a little comparison between uh Sophie and Sweet and Bitter Magic because they they're very different but have some similarities one of them being um, as you said before, part of the Adrian Tully brand is uh, girls falling in love while going on a journey. Um, so in Sweet and Bitter Magic, we're on a quest to save the kingdom from a magical plague. And in Sophie, we're on tour, which is awesome. Um, but I feel like journey books are, I mean, I'm sure I'm preaching the choir here, can be very difficult. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, how did you go about crafting these journeys? Um, like the, the stops along the way, like the, the sweepingness of the world. Um, and also what draws you to them since we've now written two of them? Yes. Um, I will also preface this by saying that in book three, they stay put, they stay put in book three. Oh, so, okay. um, I think it's because, um, after, after two times of being asked for like the map of the world and me realizing that, like, I know where the places are, 
that they go, the order the journey is, but where are they on the map? Um, that's a personal problem. Yeah. <laughs> so I, <feel> <laughs> I learned a lot from writing Sweet and Bitter Magic um, because that was, they were going like somewhere particular. And so it was like about building like realistic, real, realistic fantasy stops, realistic fantasy stops along the way of like, okay, what would they have to uncover? And in, in Sweet and Bitter Magic, a lot of their journey was like, I was a little bit like playing on like a metaphor of like what Tamsin and Run's relationship was like, as they were like dealing with each other, they're literally climbing a mountain and they're like, they're, you know, at this part of their relationship and they're literally going uphill. And so a lot of that was like, um, they're almost like very physical iteration of like what that emotional journey was like. Mm -hmm. um, and with Sophie, I feel like I got to, I feel like I got to just kind of play a little bit more because like there, it was a little bit more standardized. Like we have these towns, we have these taverns that they're performing in. And I got to sort of just like, instead of feeling like I had to cover like the entire world, I got to build little cities and I got mm -hmm. to be like, okay, this is the town where the saint did this. And that's where they have the stained glass on the chapel. And this is the town where, you know, this happens. So they have these pastries and like, it was a little bit like cozier almost um, mm -hmm. and getting to like name all of the different taverns and like come up with the different things that they're drinking and the different types of crowds and like how different audiences change your performances and um like how you have to consider your audience when you're composing a song because if they are you know laborers they're not going to want to listen to a ballad about the snow falling and if they're you know people who think that they're like you know high society they're not going to want to hear a song about a, like a dragon or something like that so it was like a little bit more fun of, of thinking about how to like cater to audiences but also getting to build the audiences so it kind of went twofold in that i was thinking about the types of songs that i had to write for the cities that they were in and the taverns they were in and it, it got to be like a nice little like layer cake every time they they traveled that's so lovely layer cake yeah the, uh you do so i love the what you said just like even though the world is so expansive, it, it always has that cozy feel everywhere they go. So lovely. Um, this is a side question, but um, do you did you ever write the songs in Sophie and the Bone Song, or like have any idea of like melodies and stuff, or just the kind of lyrics that you include in the book? So while I was, I don't have like melodies for everything. I was mostly thinking about rhythm when I was writing the lyrics more than anything. And so like from that, it, like I kind of would like hum a little bit if I was like, okay, I have to do this line. Okay, what is this gonna go? I had this like really grand ambition to like make a record of like all of the songs from the book. And then I sat down for like three hours. And I just like at one point, like looked at my wife, Katie, and I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna do this. This is really hard. <laughs> I can't imagine composing like five or six, like 13 verse epic ballad. Like, no, oh my God, we'd be like, where's Adrian? We haven't heard from her in three years. <laughs> like I said, really big, really big plans, zero execution. Um, but but I, I, I played with a few melodies like early on when I was thinking about it, but I was also very grateful for the fact that I only had to write like one verse of and I was like, and then she sang the chorus seven more times. And she rounded the 15th verse. And I was like, yep, this is why I write books. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Sophie was just built different, writing a song every single <laughs> yes. day, pretty much. Wow. Her power. Um, I also wanted to ask you um, again, just so Sweet and Bitter Magic is dual point of view, where Sophie were in just Sophie's point of view. Um, and I was just curious to ask you. Um, just how that experience was like do you prefer one or the other is one harder or easier to write yeah i love that question because i'm going to answer it and then i'm going to counter like contradict myself immediately afterwards i loved getting to write in single point of view after doing sweet and bitter magic there was something so like exciting about being able to just like stay in one character's head and like one voice like you you know better than most how you have to like stop switch remind yourself what one person knows and what somebody doesn't know remind yourself of like where their motivations are coming from that this other character doesn't even know about remind that like, it's a lot of work to write dual point of view which is one of the reasons that i am obsessed with your books by the way um awesome. because you make it seem so 
easy. And that's how I know you put in a ton of work. Um, <laughs> but you are, you are so good at it. Um, so good at it. But I, I loved getting to write single point of view for, for Sophie. Um, so of course my next book will be in dual point of view again, because. Aha. Uh -huh. I mean, Can't make this so. easy for yourself. No. No. <laughs> I think like with this book too, it was, like I said, like this is very much Sophie's story. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I thought that anybody else's brain would have taken away from like the very like careful emotional journey and like resolution that I wanted. And I, I think that like, I couldn't, it would have been fun to write Lara. Like I actually would have loved to write a little bit like from Lara's point of view, cause I love her as a character, but I think it would have distracted and, and taken away from like what I wanted to accomplish with this book. So I, I feel like this could have only just been Sophie. That's fair. I feel like both of them are very intense people in very different ways. And like yes. the combined force of two of them in one book. Maybe too much. Delightful to think about, but yeah, I totally understand that. Uh, um, okay. I think my last question for you actually, um, piggybacking off your mention of writing dual point of view again. Um, so you have a, a new duology coming out starting in 2023. Yes. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, your new book? Um, Several. <laughs> that one that is trying to kill me, um, but two, <laughs> no, I'm literally, I'm, I'm on deadline right now. But it's due on Monday. Oh, um, yeah. oh, but yeah, no, it's, yeah, super fun. We're, we're, we, we love a dual launch edit letter. Um, April's oh. been a month for me. I'm please. sleeping all throughout May. Please, please do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but very high level because I still have not perfected this elevator pitch because again, I'm in my first round of revision. So like half the book's changing. Um, we have a, basically this is the most ambitious book I've ever written. Um, so again, it's trying to kill me. It is about um, two girls, Elodie and Sabine. Um, Elodie is the first daughter of the, the queen. And in any other world, she would be set to inherit the throne, but her youngest sister has actually fulfilled a decades old prophecy um, and is the their deity reincarnated. And so she takes the throne instead. Um, but this causes some conflict uh, with the church and the crown that Elodie is not so excited about. Um, and so she's trying to preserve the sanctity of her queendom and she gets a little desperate. Um, that brings in Sabine, who is a common girl whose sadness is actually magic. So when, when she cries and bottles up her emotions, when she cries her tears, they actually um, are magic because my magic systems are always mental health allegories, I guess. Um, and so, I'm very you. <laughs> so um, basically, what happens is that uh, Sabine accidentally switches the the sleeping drought and the vial of her magic tears. So she gives Elodie her tears uh, instead of the sleeping potion to put her youngest sister oh, under a spell. Oh. And uh, yeah, they have to do some recon. So I can yeah. promise you very strange magic systems, uh, a embittered clergy, a another self-righteous heroine, and uh, potentially some cults coming in book too. So. Oh my god, that sounds absolutely incredible. Um, I will be waiting eagerly at your uh, at your doorstep for whenever you, that's where they have more eyes on it. But yeah, that sounds incredible. Um, and that is all of the questions I have for you. Um, but I do see we have some questions coming in from our lovely audience. Um, and we have about 10 more minutes. So please feel free to keep asking. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, if that's all you have, then we can, we can go ahead and move on to the questions now. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, Courtney asks, how do you think Sophie and Lara would fare in the world of, oh, sorry, An another question came in and it like moved the question up, <laughs> would fare in the world of S and BM, which I'm assuming is sweet and bitter magic. <laughs> Ooh. 
I feel like Sophie would hate it. She would just absolutely hate it. She would hate that like there are these people that are powerful enough to have like magic of their own accord. Just like Tamsin's out here, just like moving rocks and mountains and like Ren's just like offering up her power to be used by a witch. I, Sophie would hate that. She would absolutely hate that. I think that Lara and Ren would be best friends though. I feel like, I feel like a hundred percent, like a hundred percent. And Sophie and Tamsin would like look at each other like very like suspiciously and like their girlfriends would try to like make them friends. But it's like that like awkward double date where you're like, oh, like I don't love my friend's like significant other, but like I'm just here, I guess. <laughs> I feel like they would never really like fully come together. Can you please write this crossover? Yes, actually, I really want to. That's the, people it. the people demand it. <laughs> um, all right, next question comes from Jen St. Jude. Uh, would Ren, Tamsin, Sophie, and Laura get along as friends? Well, I guess in a way you just answered that. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I feel like Sophie would try to like come up with like ways to like compete with Tamsin, except like Tamsin's like the most powerful witch of her generation. So it would be like really like sad because Sophie would be like, look, I can play a bunch of scales. And Tamsin <laughs> would be like, cool, I made you a brand new loot. Like, I don't, what are we doing? Like, it would be like very much like, like when you like first get a guitar when you're like 12 and you're like, oh my God, look, I can play this song. Guys, I can play this song. And it's like <laughs> Wonderwall. <laughs> True story. Get to see my guitar in the background. Um, my dad, who is in his 50s, has been playing since he's five years old. Um, so whenever I show him something that I figured out on guitar, he's like, that's very cool. I can play Stairway to Heaven by ear. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> anyway. It sounds like if Sophie was like a music teacher, I feel like that's exactly what she would do. She'd be like, wow, good job. Anyway, here's what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> like not everything's about you, gosh. Uh, okay. Um, next question. Uh, oh, that was actually from me. Um, do you have a favorite book romance? Because you touch on some of my favorite tropes, which is the grumpy sunshine, um, enemies to lovers kind of thing. So, like, do you have a, a outside of your own romances that you've written? Do you have a favorite? I'm gonna be that author and I'm gonna be like, I have like five. So um, I'm going to first and foremost, shout out A Far Wilder Magic because Margaret and Wes <laughs> is one of my like favorite, favorite pairings that I've read in a very long time. I remember when Allison, when you sent it to me, I think I was like reading it in like the fall and we had just like gotten my puppy and I just like was like sitting on the couch and I was just like, this is making my heart so Oh. Um, it's one of my favorite pairings. Um, also, shout out to Courtney Gould, The Dead in the Dark, um, because Logan and Ashley is one of my favorite pairings, like the best. Like it's that perfect thing of like I was saying, like find the thing in the other person that you hate but that you also love. Um, and I think that The Dead in the Dark does that so well when they come out on the other side of it. So, yeah. I love that. Allison, do you have any? So many. Um, <laughs> of course, Benson and Run and Sophie and Lara. Um, otherwise, uh, I love, I mean, anyone who has talked to me for more than five minutes knows that the Scorpio races is my entire personality. So um, Sean and Puck from the Scorpio races are one of my favorite fictional couples. Um, I love EBK and Gashbar from The Wolf and the Woodsman, if you like enemies to lovers, and um, Halnick from Six of Crows. This is for you. Um, oh my God, I could just keep going. I shouldn't though. Oh, um, one more. Um, uh, oh no, it's gonna it's gonna leave me. Um, Soraya and Parvane from um, oh. Serpent Thorn. They are. Oh, wonderful. If you like monster girls, yeah. that's the book for you. Recommendations. I love you. <laughs> I just read like the like contemporary romance, like not fantasy or anything. So like, um, except for uh -huh. one of the few exceptions. Um, so like, 
I'm getting like all these cool suggestions from you guys. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Rod, Rogier, Rogier, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right, uh, asked, was writing this father different than writing the father in Sweet and Bitter Magic? Ooh, that's a good question. This, Frederick is much meaner than Ren's dad, who I've realized doesn't have a name. <laughs> I just realized that in this moment. Um, that's hilarious. No, I, I, but yes, like that's a, such a good question because I was very conscious of the fact that I had already written kind of a like failed father figure already. And like, again, not trying to give my dad a complex, I swear. Um, <laughs> but I, I, Frederick just like took, like Ren's dad was like a five and Frederick took it to like a thousand um, in terms of like bad dad. So it was different, but like it definitely grew from like the seed of, of Ren's father. And I was like, how can I just make this man much, much worse? <laughs> you were giving the full figure this time. What was that, Allison? I was just, Adrian is just giving us the full spectrum of bad dad. <laughs> bad dad. <laughs> <laughs> also, I love Courtney's comment, dads don't need names. <laughs> so true, so true. <laughs> Also, DJ, I know Adrian actually stopped by the store. I think he stopped by yesterday. I did, yeah. To sign in personalized books. I don't know if you will be back, so I can't promise any personalized books yet. But if Adrian would be so lovely as to grace I us. come back. Okay, yes. then yeah, put a little comment um, online and then just we'll put it aside until Adrian can personalize it. Um, let's see. Okay, and then Courtney asks, also for both Adrian and Allison, you both write fantasy that prioritizes emotion and character journeys over all else. What are some of your favorite softer, more emotional fantasy books? Ooh. I'm looking at my... I know, I love the like, what do I have here? Look at my bookshop. Um, one that immediately comes to mind for me is um, Ink Mistress by Audrey Colthurst. Um, Ink Mistress is Audrey's sophomore novel. It is criminally underrated. Um, it has the most lovely bisexual protagonist who is a soft healer girl who just wants to live on top of her mountain and be with her girlfriend. And uh, she's a demigoddess. How have I not read this? Right? It's, it's, it's kind of a hidden gem. Do I have it on my shelf? Get out of the way of our love magic. You're getting so many good recommendations tonight. Okay. Look at this, this book. You need the everyone needs this book. Um, if you love just soft emotional girls, this one. Love it. Um, I'll think of more, but she'll let Adrian talk so I don't just proselytize about Audrey. <laughs> no, I love it. Um, my first instinct was the midnight lie. Um by Marie Ruchowski. I definitely butchered that name. Um, but I am obsessed with that book. I read it probably once every like six months. Um, I feel like you can probably see some influence um, from that book in Sophie a little bit. Um, I, I love it. And I know it's not that underrated, but I cannot recommend it enough. Um, also one of my absolute favorite books that I just, it was the first time that I read a fantasy, and this is before I was like, really like, I'm gonna be a fantasy writer. Um, Tess of the Road by Rachel Hartman just destroyed me. And like, it, it's it's this like big book, but it's so small and, and tight and about Tess. And like, it was the first time that I was like, oh, there might be room for my weird character explorations. Like, maybe it doesn't have to just be sword fighting and like pirates and witches. Like maybe there's like room for like, more. Um, so I have not yet read In the Serpent's Wake, which is the second um, one of those. But when I'm off deadline, it's like the first thing I'm going to do. Those are such good reps. The only other one that comes to mind immediately for me is um, uh, Enchantment of Ravens, which has a little bit more action to it. But I do think it's like a quieter, more emotional. Um, oh, totally. Yeah, than, than uh, on the quieter side of YA fantasy, I'd say. One of my favorites. So good. So good. So good. <laughs> that is all we have. Um, 
This has been so wonderful. And thank you both for your answers to the audience questions and also just for your lovely discussion um, and for all the book recommendations. I have to go on my Goodreads now and like <laughs> read on like 15 different things. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming and hanging out. Um, this recording will be on YouTube eventually. <laughs> I have a little bit of a backlog, so it'll be up soon. Um, but yeah, I just don't forget to follow us on uh, all the social media at A Story Bookshop. And don't forget to press that beautiful green button and order your copy if you haven't already. And maybe, maybe uh, pick up a copy of Allison's book too. Do it. As it's so good. It, it's it, so it, good. It's so good. <laughs> um, and yeah, with that, everyone have a good night. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, everyone, for sticking around. <laughs>